Hey, here to learn something new? Well, to keep those knowledge gears greased, remember to subscribe and hit the notification button to get notified when a poppin' fresh video is ready for your consumption. If you want to be a tinkerer, here's something you should probably know about. Breadboards. Now you may want to envision breadboards as a thick piece of wooden board for which to cut bread upon. And that would be absolutely correct. Early electronics enthusiasts would use these kitchen tools as a platform for building electronics. They would either use nails or thumbtacks to run wires to different electronic components. Then throughout the 1900s, Breadboards continued to evolve until the 1970s where we got rid of the cutting board and went to a current breadboard form factor that we have today. So as I briefly mentioned, the purpose of breadboards is to help in creating circuits. They come in all different shapes and sizes for larger and smaller circuit testing. The most commonly used breadboards look like this. It's known as a solderless breadboard because it doesn't require any solder to connect components together. So how does this piece of plastic full of holes help create circuits? Let's take a closer look. Starting from the outside and working in, most breadboards have two rows of holes that run the entire length of the board with a colored stripe along either side of them. These are for the power rails that power the breadboard. There's one for a positive and one for a negative current, each denoted by a plus sign in red color for positive and a negative sign in blue or black color for negative. If we take the back off of the breadboard, we can see that the two rows each have a single metal strip that connects all the positive holes and one that connects all the negative holes. That means that no matter which hole you plug into along the board, it will be connected to the corresponding current. Be aware though that some breadboards have a break in the middle of the rows to allow for different types of currents. This means that these rows will not be connected to these rows. In order to supply power to the rails, 22 and 23 gauge wires are commonly used because they fit nicely in the holes. As far as the power supply goes, most common breadboards are rated for 5 to 15 volts at 1 amp or less. But be sure to check your breadboard specifications to be sure. That means don't go plugging a wall outlet into your breadboard because you could do some serious damage to the board and yourself. Starting off, household batteries are a good choice because they have low amperage and it's easy to find cases that will connect them to the breadboards. These inner sets of holes are called terminal strips. While the power rails run the length of the board, the terminal strips are perpendicular to the power rails. Each column of holes is separated from the next column. Again, taking off the back of the breadboard, you can see how the metal strips connect each column of holes. So while these holes are connected to each other, these holes are not. You'll also notice this big split in the board separating it into two equal sides. This is known as a dip support ravine. DIP stands for dual inline package, which is a description for a chip like this that has parallel pins on each side of it. The breadboard is designed so that you can insert the chip with its pins on each side of the DIP support ravine. So this is a DIP chip on a breadboard, while this is a DIP and chip on a breadboard. Well, all right then, let's test it out. As a simple example, let's do an LED switch where we have a 9 volt battery with a wire connector, a 470 ohm resistor, an LED, a spare piece of wire, and a button switch. Start by plugging in your power source into the power rails with the ground going to the negative rail and the positive going to the positive rail. Since mine has power rails on both sides, I'm going to have the ground and positive go into separate sides of the board. Let's add the button to the breadboard and just have it sitting across the ravine to make sure the positive and negative legs are completely separated. Using the piece of wire, we can plug it into any hole that's connected to our positive power source and plug the other end of the wire into one of the columns that a button leg is connected to. On the other side of the button, we can connect our resistor to the same column as one of these button legs and connect the other end of the resistor to an empty column that's on this half of the breadboard. Next, we can connect the positive leg of the LED to this resistor row and the negative side to the ground power source. How do you know which leg of the LED is positive and which one is negative? The shorter one is negative and the longer one is positive. 
Now the LED should also have a side that is more flat than the other side. So this also denotes the ground side. I remember it by saying that the side of the LED that has been ground down is the ground side. With everything connected, press the button and see if it lights up. And now you can do a little dance because you just created your first breadboard circuit. Now you can check breadboards off your list of tinkering skills. That's it for this chapter of the field guide. That's one more tinkering tool to add to your toolbox. Want to suggest a guide? Head on over to tinkernut.com ideas to submit your idea. If you want more tinkering videos, you can click here. Or please be kind enough to like, subscribe, or comment. If you made it this far, here's your reward. The idea for the first fax machine was invented before the first telephone. And the first lighter was invented before the first match.